All right, now let's move on to talk about how blood pressure and cardiac output are regulated uh, by the heart and the cardiovascular system. So if you remember, one of the things we're talking about, uh, one thing I want you to keep thinking about throughout the semester, and as we talk about the cardiovascular system, is why is VO2 max so drastically reduced in patients with heart failure? Now, we have the FIC principle that we've talked about a few times. FIC principle says VO2. We could put a little dot over here. That there should be a dot. It's just PowerPoint doesn't make it easy to put dots. So the VO2 uh, at any given time can be calculated as the product of cardiac output times the difference in arterial and venous oxygen content. So you see how much oxygen is in the blood in the artery and then how much is left in the vein once it goes past the muscle. You multiply that difference, how much is missing, by the cardiac output, and you can measure how much oxygen is being consumed. Now this CaO2, this is the one that had a really long equation where you had to know total concentration of hemoglobin times 1.34 times percent sat over 100 times. PaO2 times 0 0.003. Remember that one? My lovely handwriting. So that's what we're calculating here with the CaO2. If we want the CvO2, we just take the hemoglobin concentration in the vein, which should be the same, times the saturation in the vein and the pressure in the vein. That's it. That's the only difference. So the question is, why does cardiac output drop during... Uh, during heart failure, one obvious answer, or why does VO2 drop, is one obvious answer is cardiac output. It is heart failure, right? We got this upset heart over here, exhausted. It can't pump as much blood. But we'll also see throughout the rest of the semester that there are actually factors influencing the ability to get oxygen out of the blood as well in heart failure. It's not just how much blood the heart pumps, but if that blood gets directed to the right muscles, which tends to not happen right in heart failure. Also with aging, the heart pumps blood, but it doesn't go to the right spot. Uh, so there's multiple things that can be happening with heart failure. So keep reflecting on that as you go through these lectures. So today we're gonna to talk about how the heart pumps blood and what factors determine cardiac output. Uh, the thing I've chosen for you to, to like emphasize a million times is this equation. The cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. And we'll talk about those um, in, in a little bit. Now, if you remember, in the last lecture, we talked how, skeletal, how cardiac muscle contracts. Remember, the cardiac muscle is slightly different than skeletal muscle in that it can increase the force it produces. Um, all cardiac muscle cells are presumably are going to be contracting for each heartbeat. So you can't do this idea of increased recruitment or size principle. So you have to, and, and you also, you can't increase the frequency of action potentials to get something to contract harder because you have to have everything contract in a very ordered fashion, right? You, you only get one contraction uh, because if you had multiple action potentials, you'd get fibrillation. fibrillation and that's not going to pump your blood. So the way that your heart can make the muscle contract harder or softer is by this calcium-induced calcium release, where calcium flux through the, through the extracellular membrane, through this membrane, induces more release from the SR, and it's the total amount of calcium that influences how strong the contraction is, because it exposes more actin and myosin. Now, if you, the sympathetic nervous system like epinephrine, increases this calcium flux. So you would get more calcium going in and stronger contractions. That will help the heart generate greater levels of pressure. So when we're talking about pressure generation in the heart, it's all that actinomyosin and cross bridging that we talked about with skeletal muscle. Uh, but it's just applied in the heart with maybe a couple of different mechanisms here and there, but it's mostly the same concept. So blood pressure. Blood pressure is an index of how hard the heart is working. And we have something called mean arterial pressure, often abbreviated as MAP. And MAP, or mean arterial pressure, is just 
average blood pressure in the artery. Now, you guys are probably familiar with blood pressure being indicated as like 120 over 80, or you have systolic over diastolic. That's two numbers. That's an extremely simplified version of what the pressure in your, in your blood is like, in your arteries. Yeah, that would kind of indicate that you're either at systole or diastole, and so your blood pressure would fluctuate like that in a square wave. That is not what happens. Your pressure is in constant flux. Here's some data that I collected a couple years ago. Uh, looking right here at mean arterial pressure, we actually put pressure transducers in someone's femoral artery. So we're measuring pressure directly in the artery. And every one of these, this is the EKG. So every time you see a spike here, that's a heartbeat or systole. And you can see that a little bit after the spike, you get an increase in pressure in the, in the femoral vein, artery that then dissipates. Uh, okay, so it takes a while for that pressure wave to go from the heart to the leg. That's why they don't happen heartbeat pressure at the exact same time. It takes a while to travel, kind of like dominoes. Moving the domino all the way from the aorta all the way down to the femoral artery is going to take some time. But also look, Notice that we don't have this square wave setup that I was in that 120 over 80 or systolic over diastolic insinuates. This would be systolic pressure, diastolic pressure, systolic pressure, diastolic pressure. So systolic is the peak, the diastolic is the trough, but there's a whole lot in between, right? We don't have a square wave. And, and so what mean arterial pressure is, uh, perfectly calculated it would just be the pressure every millisecond over this amount of time or whatever amount of time averaged right so it'd be the average of this plus this plus this plus this plus this all of them not just the top and the bottom now that's kind of hard to do you could imagine that you don't really want to stick a pressure transducer in someone's artery all the time it'd be kind of uncomfortable so there are a couple of ways that we can estimate it, and we use the systolic and diastolic to estimate the average or mean arterial blood pressure. And we'll get to that in a second. But conceptually, there are two things that determine your mean arterial blood pressure. That is cardiac output, how much blood is coming out of the heart, and total vascular resistance, or also sometimes called peripheral vascular resistance, systemic vascular resistance, this TVR is synonymous with systemic vascular resistance and peripheral vascular resistance, at least in the for what we're concerned with in, in this class. All right, so cardiac output times the resistance, how much uh, the arteries are squeezing, really, or resisting the increase in flow. If we were trying to simplify it down, which factor would be which? The cardiac output is going to have a more direct factor on the systolic pressure, while the vascular resistance is going to have a more direct fact effect on the diastolic pressure. Uh, there's considerable overlap where total vascular resistance will impact systolic pressure and cardiac output will impact diastolic, but conceptually, the resistance or how much the arteries are squeezed, right? Your arteries can dilate or constrict the more constricted they are, the more resistance. Uh, the more resistance, the greater the blood pressure, and most likely you would see that as an increased diastolic pressure. So conceptually, these are the factors that influence, uh, that are going to influence mean arterial pressure, cardiac output and total vascular resistance. Now, we, as I mentioned, we estimate, can estimate systole, or mean arterial blood pressure at rest by using our diastolic and systolic pressure. If you remember from our last, uh, our last discussion, diastolic pressure is where the heart spends most of its time, diastole, at rest, about two thirds of the time. Now, at rest, only about one third of the time is in systole. So what you do to, cal to 
estimate mean arterial pressure or average arterial blood pressure at rest, you take your diastolic blood pressure, so this would be like 80, and you, then you add the systolic 120 minus the diastolic 80 divided by three. And the whole point of that, dividing by three, is because this part represents systole. And you're only in systole for about a third of the time. Uh, the rest of the time you're in diastole. And so diastole gets a bigger contribution to that equation. As I mentioned in the previous slide, that this cardiac cycle with systole only making up a third of the cardiac cycle, that's only really good at rest. During exercise, a really intense exercise, systole will make up 50% or maybe even a little bit more of the cardiac cycle. So this equation that you learn in all your physiology labs or in textbooks, this is good for rest. Uh, there are other equations that you would want to look at for exercise. And a lot of times they'll just, instead of dividing by three, they'll just divide by two in those equations. But it's always an estimate. Measuring this way with catheters directly in the artery is the gold standard, but obviously you don't want to do that every time you go to the doctor's office. All right, so what factors are going to determine this blood pressure? As I mentioned, mean arterial pressure is the product of cardiac output and total vascular resistance. So what factors influence cardiac output? Cardiac output itself is equal to heart rate and stroke volume. So how many times the heart beats per minute and how much blood is pumped out with every beat? Those two things will tell us what the cardiac output is. This equation, Q, cardiac output, this one should remind you of ventilation, pulmonary ventilation or minute ventilation, where how much air comes in and, that comes in and out of your lungs is equal to tidal volume. Wow, what'd that do? Tidal volume times the breathing frequency. All right, so our heart rate is equivalent to breathing frequency and tidal volume is equivalent, equivalent to stroke volume, All right? So that's how we're calculating how much blood the heart pumps every minute. So mean arterial pressure is, by definition, is going to be influenced by heart rate and by stroke volume. And we'll talk more about that equation in a second. Now total vascular resistance or systemic vascular resistance, uh, resistance of any kind, we could really even just simplify this down to just say resistance. Resistance is going to be the product of the viscosity of the blood times the length of the, the, circuit, the tube that it has to flow through, divided by radius to the fourth power. Now, let's make a quick connection here. This equation is just the inverse, part of the, part of, an inverse of part of Pessoy's law. Remember this, I can't spell it. We'll just, anytime, here's a secret to success in life. Uh, when you don't know how to spell something, just kind of scribble it. And do the first two letters and then just scribble it. Doctors do it all the time. It's fantastic. All right, so Poissoli's law says that flow is going to be equal to the change in pressure times pi to, times r to the fourth over 8nL. So resistance is really just the inverse of these where we now have, let's just move it up here, Now we, where we now have radiuses on the denominator now. So what this means is the radius, the more dilated your arteries are, the bigger this number is going to be in the denominator. The bigger the number in the denominator, the lower the resistance, right? So dilation is going to have a huge impact on how much resistance there is, and resistance has a huge impact on mean arterial pressure. So if your artery is really small like this, it's not going to, you're going to have really high pressure. But if your artery is dilated like this, you're going to have low pressure. Now, let's let's take a second to catch up and try and apply some of these things. Let's this is an example of like a, a test question. Which of the following would not contribute to an increased mean arterial pressure? So if we increase heart rate, is that going to increase mean arterial pressure? Remember, mean arterial pressure is equal to Q times vascular resistance 
we'll just put systemic vascular resistance. I think actually in the last one I had total vascular resistance. Not going to make a difference for our class. There's subtle differences in those definitions, but anytime you see resistance, just consider it all the same for this class. Okay. When you go to med school, it'll be a little different story, but I don't want to complicate things right now. All right. So map Q times total vascular resistance. Q is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. All right. So if we increase the heart rate, that is going to increase cardiac output, which would increase MAP. What if we decrease the stroke volume? If we do decrease stroke volume, that's going to decrease cardiac output, which will decrease MAP. Now, what if we increase cardiac output? Increase cardiac output, we increase MAP. All right. What if we increase blood viscosity? How does that influence? Where, where does blood viscosity have anything to do with mean arterial pressure? If you remember resistance is going to be equal to viscosity times length times r to the fourth. All right, so if we have higher viscosity, that's what this n is. That's a terrible n. I tried to make it fancy. So that viscosity, if we have high viscosity, that's going to increase resistance and increase mean arterial pressure. All right, so when would you see increased viscosity? If you're dehydrated, um, you lose a lot of plasma volume, and so that raises your hematocrit. The percent of your blood that's made of red blood cells goes from like 40% to maybe 60%. That would increase your viscosity and make your blood pressure go up. Um, you also have things like high altitude pulmonary edema, uh, where in response to uh, in response to the hypoxia associated with high altitude, some people. Uh, I guess this isn't so much edema, but in response to a high altitude, sometimes people get an increased synthesis of red blood cells. Uh, and so the hematocrit goes from being about 45% red blood cell to 80%. And now you have your blood going from being very free flowing to being like jelly. Uh, like just imagine pulling out some grape jelly and trying to pump that around through your aorta and the rest of the arteries. It's not going to be easy, right? That's going to increase your blood pressure. Now, increase the length of the arteries would also, that fits here in the in resistance, that's going to increase MAP as well. Uh, the length of the arteries, I've never been able to think of a scenario where that's really going to change acutely. Uh, you might have something going on with growth, uh, getting older, but uh, not so much uh, in, in terms of exercise or even exercise training. So which of these factors are going to potentially change during exercise training? Heart rate definitely goes up during exercise training. Stroke volume goes up during exercise training. Cardiac output is changed during exercise training. Uh, like just short duration exercise. Blood viscosity, if you get dehydrated during the exercise, that might go up, but it's not going to have a huge impact, but it can change. The length of the arteries, not so much. This, the radius, that is going to change a ton during exercise, and that accounts for a lot of the change in mean arterial pressure during exercise. All right. We've kind of hinted at it. What factors influence cardiac output? So cardiac output is the product of heart rate times stroke volume. This diagram illustrates some of the factors that are going to influence your cardiac output. And we're going to dissect it little by little. When I think of cardiac output, uh, I like to explain it in terms of pumping up a basketball. Uh, so in this scenario, your heart is a pump. That's all it is. It's just a, a fancy pump. Uh, so we have a little hand pump here. That would be the equivalent of your heart, okay? And we're trying to pump up a basketball. The air coming out of the pump would be similar to the blood, right? So cardiac output is going to be equal to your heart rate times your stroke volume. How much air is coming out of the pump every minute is going to be equal to the stroke volume, how much air comes out of the pump with each beat or each pump, and then how many pumps you do every minute. That's going to determine your cardiac output. What factors influence these things? Heart rate is strongly influenced by parasympathetic and sympathetic activity. Remember, sympathetic acti activity starts to depolarize the membrane potential towards threshold, so it takes longer to get, takes less time, sorry, takes less time to get to a heartbeat, uh, so it increases heart rate. Parasympathetic activity hyperpolarizes you away from threshold, so it's gonna take longer for your heart to beat. Now, what factors influence uh, influence these different things. Um, 
One of the things that you're often familiar with, uh, people coming in a lot of times know, all right, if I'm exercise trained, I'm going to have a lower heart rate at rest. Why does that happen? Now, with exercise training, what's going on is cardiac output at rest is going to stay pretty much the same. So you know heart rate is going down at rest with training, right? A fit person might have a heart rate, resting heart rate of about 60 beats per minute, maybe a little lower, maybe 50. Uh, elite level people, even less. But if cardiac output stays the same, what does that mean? With a less heart rate, stroke volume must be going up. So what happens with exercise training is you get a bigger pump. Instead of using that puny little hand pump, now you have a pump that is filled with a lot more blood. So every time you eject blood, you're ejecting more blood with each beat. So it takes fewer beats to get the same volume out. That's why resting heart rate goes down with endurance training. But max heart rate doesn't really go down all that much. Um, so here, here is what we see, like an untrained person, you might see a resting heart rate of 70, 75 beats per minute, um, and a stroke volume at rest 70, 60 milliliters per minute. The standard cardiac output at rest is usually considered about five liters per minute. Now, if you endurance train, uh, the resting heart rate decreases as we mentioned. Now we're looking at 50 instead of 70, but the stroke volume has increased, so we're keeping about the same cardiac output. But what about exercise? And so now we're going to look at these numbers for max exercise. Max exercise, untrained person, max heart rate's about 200 beats per minute for a young healthy individual, rough estimate. If you go through eight weeks of endurance training, your max heart rate either is unchanged or it goes down slightly. Here they've gone with an exaggeration. Usually you won't even see a 10 beat decrease in max heart rate. But that, that's the right concept, right? You, you're not going to get an increase in max heart rate. It, it stays the same or maybe goes down slightly. Why? Um, we, you don't have to change it. Most of the changes are going to occur in your stroke volume, right? So let's, let's look at the cardiac output. So max cardiac output for an untrained male is about 22, female about 18 liters per minute. If you're endurance training, you can get up to the 30s. Um, you can, the, this is a ridiculously high cardiac output of 34 liters. That's like elite level. This isn't just trained, right? So this would be like uh, your, your world record holders and marathons and cycling. That's what they're pumping out, right? But they're doing it with fewer beats per minute, right? The untrained person gets 200 beats per minute but the trained person only 190 and they get way more blood out of that heart because they're pumping way more blood out with each beat. The reason they do that is they've gone from having a little Grinch sized heart to with endurance training. Now their heart is huge. Wow. Uh, a big heart. All right. So the size of that left ventricle that's pumping the blood has increased. And so they can pump more blood with fewer beats. So that's what's happening with cardiac output. So what influences heart rate? We talked about it a little bit already. Parasympathetic, sympathetic activity is going to influence heart rate. You have sympathetic nerves going on to the SA node, a, uh, parasympathetic nerves as well, and they're either going to hyperpolarize, parasympathetic hyperpolarize, or sympathetic depolarize. All right, so this would, parasympathetic down, this would be an example of positive ions out, and going, the sympathetic stimulation is going to result in positive ions in to depolarize you, right? So epinephrine is going to bind to receptors, and that's going to allow calcium and other positive ions to flow into the cell and get you closer to threshold. Acetylcholine will bind to receptors on the SA node, and it's going to hyperpolarize. The acetylcholine opens up channels that allow positive ions to flow out and negative ions to flow in. It hyperpolarizes you. That's your primary influence on your heart rate. Now, as I mentioned before, if we take your heart out of your body and disconnect all the nerves, you're going to have the heart still beating. It has its own rhythmicity. It lets positive ions into the heart, into the SA node, all by itself. It's naturally leaky. And that'll happen at about 100 beats per minute if we take out all nerves 
the heart will beat 100 beats per minute. So right now you're watching this video, you're probably falling asleep, and your heart rate is probably somewhere around 70 beats per minute. Um, that means that you have parasympathetic activity inhibiting you or slowing down, hyperpolarizing the action potential, the membrane potential, to slow down your action potentials in your heartbeat. Now, when you start to exercise, you're at, at rest, you're hanging out right here at 70 beats per minute, let's say. When you start to exercise, the first thing you gotta do is take away the parasympathetic activity. So parasympathetic activity is like the brake. Um, you take your foot off the brake, remove the inhibition by parasympathetic activity, and then you start hitting the gas with the sympathetic activity to spin, speed up. So you have two things, this competition between parasympathetic inhibition and sympathetic stimulation controlling your heart rate. So this says with a neighbor, you're, you're working at home, maybe go get your room, roommate or your spouse, whoever's there watching with you, talk about it, or you can just talk to yourself. Look at this and describe what's happening during exercise. So these are data I collected on a person when they went from rest to exercise. Pause the video, try and explain what's going on. Uh, also, you can see here's the person's mean arterial blood pressure, rest, exercise. All right, so tell me what's going on here with sympathetic, parasympathetic. So at rest, point A, we're going to have a lot of parasympathetic going without much sympathetic, a little sympathetic, but it's far outweighed by the parasympathetic inhibition. During B, we're taking away the parasympathetic inhibition. That allows us to get up to a threshold faster at the SA node and generate more action potentials rapidly. Now at point C, this is going to be predominantly sympathetic activity. Just as a rule of thumb, um, if your heart rate is below 100 beats per minute, you got a decent amount of parasympathetic activity going. If it's above, your changes in the heart rate are primarily dictated by sympathetic activity like epinephrine, norepinephrine, adrenaline, all that is going in and causing the heart rate to increase. So we talked about heart rate, right? Heart rate, cardiac output is influenced by heart rate and stroke volume. Heart rate was a lot of sympathetic activity and parasympathetic activity. What about stroke volume? What factors influence how much blood the heart pumps every beat? Um, the first thing is just the, the volume of the heart this end diastolic volume. If you have a tiny itty bitty heart, uh, your stroke volume is gonna be little. If you have a giant heart, your stroke volume is going to be big just because of the size, right? But let's say during acute exercise, the size of your heart isn't gonna change. Endurance training, growth, puberty, all that stuff increases the size of your heart. But let's just say you go from sitting on your chair to exercising. How are you increasing cardiac output? Part, you're increasing heart rate. But stroke volume also increases. So we're now going to talk about what factors influence stroke volume. Now the first thing that influences stroke volume is preload. Um, and that's going to come in on this stretch. I like my, my summary a little better than the textbook. So regulation of stroke volume, preload, or end diastolic volume, I guess that's a little bit better, and diastolic volume, how much blood you have in the heart at the end of diastole, that is going to determine how much you can eject. You Physically, you cannot eject more blood than is in the heart to begin with, right? So you one goal during exercise is to get as much blood back to the heart as possible so it can pump out more blood. Now, it's not just that having a greater volume equals a greater amount that you can eject. Um, it's not just a linear relationship. If it was linear, it would look something like this, where for every given increase in end diastolic volume, you'd have a predictable, very linear increase in stroke volume. That's actually not what we see. We actually see this curvilinear relationship here that at least at the initial spots, you're getting a greater than linear increase in a greater than expected increase in stroke volume for an increase in diastolic volume. So you fill up the heart a little bit, 
you get a little strong contraction. You fill it up a little bit more, you get a way stronger contraction and eject more blood. Uh, why is that? Well, what happens is something called the Frank Starling mechanism. Uh, this thing over here, Frank Starling mechanism. And it all comes back down to the optimal length and overlap of those sarcomeres. Uh, so you remember the, the muscle fibers, they're, they're gonna have actin and myosin, and the better they overlap, the stronger you can contract. When you are increasing your volume in, in this range, you're, you're going, going from 100 to 200, you're improving the overlap so that you have all the actin able to connect with myosin and vice, or myosin with actin, and so you have all cross bridges complete and you get a way stronger contraction. If you're at more than optimal length, so here's like a sarcomere, this would be optimal length where we get a lot of good overlap here, so we get a lot of connection between actin and myosin. Let's say that you're way too stretched. Now we only get a little bit of overlap between myosin and actin, and so you don't get a forceful contraction. Uh, so the Frank Starling mechanism, returning more blood to the heart, improves that overlap so you can get stronger contractions, and that increases your stroke volume. So what factors affect venous return or that preload, right? Venous return, remember, venous return, preload, how much blood to your heart influences that optimal length. So now we're going to talk about what factors influence venous return. So venous return can be influenced by three things. We'll have venous constriction, muscle pump, and the respiratory pump. Um, the veins, especially in your legs, the veins are very distensible. They're stretchy. They're called capacitance vessels, meaning that they can stretch and hold increasingly greater volumes of blood. Um, if you're just standing there not doing anything, those veins are gonna fill up and distend, and you'll have a lot of your blood volume just trapped in those in those veins, in your legs, and in your in your gut, and your viscera, and all that. So one thing that you can do to improve venous return is make those veins stiffer, make them contract so they're not holding as much blood, right? So let's say at rest, this is your vein, you're filled with red blood cells, then you stand there in place without contracting, the vein is going to expand and get way bigger and you have more blood trapped in there. Blood that's stuck in the vein is blood that can't get back to the heart, and that means less venous return, less stroke volume. So what your body does is it causes venoconstriction, and now it forces that vein to be smaller. Smooth muscle in the vein contracts and returns that blood back to the heart so it can be used. So your veins kind of look like a, a little reservoir of blood where it's storing blood that it can use for later to increase venous return and stroke volume. Uh, the reason I have these compression socks on here, um, individuals with heart failure especially, uh, left heart, right heart failure, uh, they tend to get edema or pooling down here in, in their legs. So they'll, you'll see the legs swell up. That's called edema. Now, Part of that edema is going to be because they have a huge amount of blood volume getting trapped there in the legs. Um, the heart isn't able to accommodate much blood flow, and so it, get, it gets all backed up and gets stored back down in the legs. And the more you store in those veins, the more likely it is to go out into the extracellular fluid and make your legs swell and get bigger. So these compression socks keep, they act as almost venoconstrictors. They keep the veins from expanding and make it so that you can return more blood to the heart. Um, the compression pants and stuff that people wear for, like BYU basketball players seem to be all in on these white compression pants. Um, it's not really been shown to improve venous return to young, healthy individuals, especially when you're exercising, you have this muscle pump that we'll talk about that makes sure that the blood gets there really fast. Um, but those compression shorts, there is some evidence that it helps with recovery from exercise. Um, more and more I'm seeing like these elite marathoners, they're wearing compression socks and sleeves on their arms. Um, now, part of the idea of that is that the arm isn't all that active during running, at least the forearm. And so you want to minimize how much blood is, is stored and trapped in there. 
And so they use these sleeves that minimize swelling and distension, venous swelling, in the arm. So you put that sleeve on, and that means less blood's trapped in the arm, more blood gets back to the heart, which means greater stroke volume, greater cardiac output, which helps you have a higher VO2. All right, so venous constriction. Um, why do we have to have this venous constriction? Uh, and and everything, because the veins are very distensible, right? Now let's talk about these muscle pumps and respiratory pumps. Um, your heart is a pump, right? And the job of the heart is to get blood from the heart to the periphery. Uh, and it does that by generating high pressure, like 120 millimeters mercury or something like that. Now your muscles, and your legs especially, are, and then the, the diaphragm and everything in your respiratory system are also gonna act like pumps. They're your second heart. Second and third heart, I guess. Uh, the, the muscles, as they contract, they squeeze those veins to make the blood flow back up. So here's a picture of a person just standing at rest. And as they stand, so here standing at rest, after standing for a long time, you can see that the veins start to expand or distend, and they're distending even more. So that's without any kind of muscle contraction. When you contract the muscle, the muscles squeeze the little venules and veins and basically milk the blood back up to the heart and then to the brain. What, one of the issues with this is that uh, with venous return and the muscle pump is that if you don't use this muscle pump, you, you might pass out. Right? We have a lot of blood pooling here in the legs, and blood that pools there doesn't get back to the heart. Blood that doesn't get back to the heart doesn't make it to the brain. You pass out. Right? So why do we get this? Why are we so susceptible to pooling? Well, part of it is because this is a couple million years ago or whenever, we decided that we didn't want to walk on all fours anymore. We wanted to walk upright. And so look where our heart is in relation to our blood volume. Our heart is right near the top of our body, and all the blood is down here. In order for the blood to get back to the heart, it has to overcome gravity. And that's where the muscle pump comes in. It helps the blood overcome gravity to get back to the heart. If you didn't activate the muscles, the blood would get trapped here, and you'd have less going to your heart. Now, look at where our heart is compared to a dog. This looks like my new little dog. So there's the heart of the dog. 70% of the blood volume in a dog is at or above the level of the heart in a dog. So it doesn't have the problem of gravity. It actually has gravity helping return blood to the heart. Whereas for us, because 70% of our blood is below the heart, gravity actually hinders return of blood to the heart. That's why we need this second pump, the muscle pump or the respiratory pump. It overcomes gravity to return blood to the heart. So when you start exercising, the muscle pump squeezes and milks the blood back to the heart. If you don't squeeze your, your muscles or if you stand in place for too long, the blood will pool and you'll pass out. So exercise with the contractions is basically like recruiting the second heart or second pump to get blood circulating throughout your system. All right, so that was all what factors influence venous return and stroke volume. Um, now let's look at something else. The title of this slide is off. Now we're going to look at what factors affect cardi affect stroke volume. So what factors affect stroke volume? Wow, this slide all messed up. I apologize. You'd think I would have fixed this by now, but I didn't. And I apologize. So what factors affect stroke volume? First thing we said was preload or venous return. Now we're going to look at something else called afterload. Um, let me illustrate the difference between preload and afterload. So let's say this is your anatomical heart. Hate to break it to anyone, that's not really what your heart looks like, but it's really simple to draw. So preload would be blood and the pressure of blood coming into the heart. Afterload is the pressure of blood working back on the heart. This is afterload. So you guys are familiar with afterload. Uh, if you've ever pumped up a bike, pumped up a basketball, 
Here we're going to illustrate basketball. The first couple of pumps, when the ball is flat, are really easy, right? It's not hard to push the air into the ball because there's not much in there. But when you get to where the ball is really pumped up or your tire is really pumped up, uh, it, you have to push really hard to get that air to go into the ball or into the tire. That The reason you have to push really hard is because there's a really high pressure in the ball or in, in the tire. The higher that pressure, uh, the higher a pressure you have to generate in order to get air to flow that way. So afterload is the pressure of the air acting back on the pump. Afterload in the heart is the pressure of blood in the arteries working back on the aortic valve. In order for this little valve right here to open, the pressure in the heart let me change colors. Again, I don't know why it does that. You get to see all the slides as a sneak peek. The pressure in the heart has to exceed the pressure in the blood. All right, so pressure here must be greater than the pressure in the ball or pressure in the heart has to exceed the pressure in the artery. And the greater this gradient, the higher the pressure is above pressure one in the heart is above pressure two in the, in the artery, the faster the blood's gonna flow, the greater the stroke volume. If you have a really high pressure here, let's say you have a high uh, blood pressure, this is gonna be diastolic pressure primarily, if there's not a big pressure gradient, then the blood's not going to flow and you aren't going to get a lot of ejection of blood. After load, uh, after load is essentially diastolic blood pressure is the main factor that influences your afterload. It's the resistance that the heart must overcome in order to get blood to go out of the heart into the arteries. If the heart can't generate a pressure above diastolic pressure, uh, it's never going to get blood out because it won't open that valve. So the higher the diastolic pressure, the smaller the stroke volume. So what are some of the consequences of a high afterload or high diastolic pressure? If you need to get a high stroke volume out and you have a high afterload, that means you're going to have to contract the heart even harder. That means more, uh, more actin and myosin interacting, that means more ATP. It's going to require more ATP, more oxygen, more energy to get uh, blood out of the heart if you have a high diastolic pressure. Let me illustrate it one other way. So let's say this is the aorta and we have our heart over here. We have this valve and the aortic valve is a one-way valve. So the pressure inside here from the heart has to be greater than the pressure outside in order for the valves to open and blood to flow out. So let's say we have a really high pressure out here so the, the P gets bigger. That means that the heart has to squeeze harder to open up that valve. So now the heart has to contract harder, make a bigger pressure. Uh, in order to eject blood. That's more work on the heart. That's a terrible setup for someone that has a weak heart. Unfortunately, this happens a lot in heart failure. Uh, in the initial stages of heart failure, especially like hypertension, in hypertension, this P gets really big. The afterload pressure is exaggerated uh, because of, a lot of times, because of vasoconstriction. So in order to eject blood out of the heart, now the heart has to contract even harder to generate even more pressure so that the pressure coming out of the heart is greater than the pressure acting back on it. In heart failure, the heart is exhausted. And that means you're making the heart work even harder when it's already tired. That's a bad deal. So individuals with heart failure, you want to make sure that you minimize that afterload. So scenarios that are going to cause a high afterload 
um, like go exercising in the cold causes vasoconstriction or just being exposed to the cold. Uh, stressful situations causes sympathetic response, causes high afterload. Um, that's going to cause uh, this P, the afterload P, to get larger. And the larger this gets, the harder the heart has to work. And if the heart is tired, the heart's going to complain. And when the heart complains, you get that angina or chest pain. So when do people get chest pain? It's when they're doing things that make this P get bigger, the afterload get bigger, which in turn means that the pressure generated by the heart gets bigger. In order to generate more pressure with the heart, the heart has to contract harder or work harder. So people get angina or chest pain when they're exercising because they have to generate high pressures or they get chest pain when they have high sympathetic activity, they're stressed. Uh, there's lots of funny studies showing that the rates of heart attack go up during like things like the Super Bowl uh, because people get really into it and get really stressed with that sympathetic response. So the heart has to pump harder, right? And the higher the pressure, the more the heart has to work. And if the heart's fatigued, that's a bad deal and you're going to get chest pain. All right. So how else uh, can you increase stroke volume? Let me again cross this out. How do you increase stroke volume? We're all focused on stroke volume. What factors increase or influence stroke volume? Um, dang, that slide was bad too. I'm flunking this part right now. Um, so stroke volume influenced by preload, afterload, and now the third one is contractility. Um, contractility is how hard the heart is contracting. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the sympathetic system, when the epinephrine binds and norepinephrine bind to the beta receptor, the receptor on the heart, it causes an influx of calcium. And as calcium flows into the cardiomyocyte, that opens up more actin and myosin binding sites, which means more cross bridging and a stronger contraction. So here's an example of the, the stroke volume, given stroke volume for a given filling. You fill up the heart to 100 milliliters at rest, you can expect that much of a stroke volume. You do it at rest to 300 milliliters, that's how much stroke volume you can expect. Now, if you inject epinephrine, like you hit someone with an EpiPen, and while they're still resting, you will see an increased stroke volume. They're ejecting a greater proportion, a greater fraction, of their the volume in their ventricle because the, the epinephrine is making the heart contract more vigorously. More actin and myosin interacting, a greater contraction, greater force. Um, and so that, that increases how much stroke volume you get. So preload, afterload, and contractility are the things that are going to affect stroke volume. Um, beta blockers. Uh, the sympathetic activity influences your car cardiac output quite a bit. A very common blood pressure medication is called propranolol, or it's often just referred to as a beta blocker. And the beta refers to the receptor that epinephrine goes to. Um, so remember, epinephrine and norepinephrine are going to bind to a beta receptor on the heart muscles, cardiomyocytes, that are going to increase heart rate and increase contractility, which will increase stroke volume, right? So the epinephrine causes a major increase in cardiac output. So why would you give these to a person with high blood pressure? Well, let's think about what factors influence mean arterial blood pressure. Mean arterial blood pressure is cardiac output times resistance. So the beta blocker minimizes or reduces your cardiac output and thereby decreases your mean arterial pressure. That's one of the benefits of these beta blocker medications. Um, other blood pressure medications um, will target resistance. And so you'll give like dilators that uh, cause the arteries to get bigger, which decreases resistance and decreases mean arterial pressure. So this is a really good um, diagram illustrating the factors that influence stroke volume.
Um, one other thing that we didn't really highlight was the influence of plasma volume. The more volume of blood you have, uh, the more is available to pump. Uh, so we can increase your stroke volume and also increase your blood max blood pressure. We can increase even your VO2 max if we just load you with a little more plasma volume. If we inject saline into you, uh, we can increase how much volume of blood is in there and that'll allow your heart to pump a little bit more blood every minute. Um, what do I... So let's just make one more connection. All right, um, so we've talked about cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. Remember, VO2, oh, come on. VO2 is equal to cardiac output times arterial venous oxygen difference. So anything that's gonna increase your ability to pump blood, increase your cardiac output, can potentially increase your VO2 max. If you decrease peripheral resistance, that will increase stroke volume, which will increase cardiac output, which may potentially increase VO2 max. If you, if you plasma volume load, uh, that means put in a little extra saline in there essentially, uh, in the blood, that can increase your stroke volume and potentially increase your cardiac output, which can potentially increase your VO2 max. Now the problem with plasma volume loading is that as you put in more saline, you're diluting the arterial oxygen content, which is going to decrease your AVO2 difference. So there's a very fine balance if you want to increase uh, blood volume by plasma, like by injecting saline, uh, you're, it's only gonna help you for a little bit before you're starting to dilute the red blood cells too much and then it actually can be detrimental. All right, so how does the heart change with exercise training? Let's wrap this up. This one's getting long here. Uh, hopefully you've been able to pause and go eat some, some carrots or Twinkies or whatever you have in your fridge. Um, I apologize for how long this one is. So again, let's just pretend like your heart is this pump, right? You have two types of hypertrophy in the heart. One is called eccentric hypertrophy, and that is where the volume or the size of the ventricle gets bigger and the walls get maybe a little bit bigger, but not that much. The main adaptation to eccentric hypertrophy is an expansion in the size of the ventricle. This happens because of a volume overload. Volume overload is where you have a high preload, a lot of blood returning back to the heart. That's stuff that you see in endurance training, right? As you endurance train, you have that muscle pump, you have venous constriction, it's returning blood to the heart really quickly. That volume stretches the heart, and as it stretches, it's signaling over time for the heart to remodel outward and expand. This is eccentric hypertrophy. You know, that is why, this eccentric hypertrophy is why your endurance athletes have such ridiculously high cardiac outputs, because they have big hearts. Now let's look at the other type of heart adaptation, and this is concentric hypertrophy. Now the size of the heart, if we were to look for, at it from the outside, probably hasn't changed all that much with concentric hypertrophy, but the walls get thicker. And as the walls get thicker, it comes at the expense of the size or how much volume the inside of the ventricle can accommodate. Um, it's, it's not gonna be able to pump as much blood. In this scenario, stroke volume is actually gonna go down. The end diastolic volume, how much blood fits in there is reduced and so your stroke volume can decrease. Why on earth would you ever have this kind of inward remodeling? Why would it go that way? Um, it because of pressure. This is a pressure overload, afterload. High afterload causes the heart to have to contract harder to get blood out. And so over time, as the heart is trying to contract harder and harder, it decides to remodel by having bigger and bigger muscle and a thicker wall to generate higher pressures. That high pressure comes at the expense of not being able to have as much volume in there. So eccentric hypertrophy is the most beneficial kind in terms of endurance exercise. And this is what we typically see with aerobic training. Very clearly happens with aerobic training. Um, most of the time with strength training, you'll also see maybe a little bit of this eccentric hypertrophy. 
every once in a while with strength training, you might see uh, concentric hypertrophy. When you strength train, blood pressure skyrockets. If you're doing a deadlift, your resting diastolic pressure can go from 80 millimeters of mercury all the way up to like 250 or 300 millimeters of mercury. Really high pressure, a high afterload. And, and so the heart can adapt to that afterload if it's stimulated frequently enough by increasing the thickness of the wall to, to generate more pressure. Um, that can happen sometimes with strength training. It's not a given. Um, in fact, most of the time with strength training that most like recreationally active people do, you're going to see the volume overload. When you do see uh, pressure overload and concentric hypertrophy is almost always with hypertension. Uh, high blood pressure, that means the heart has to pump against a higher pressure every beat, all day, every day. And so it adapts by getting a thicker wall to, to accommodate that need for high pressure. And so people that have hypertension will often have concentric hypertrophy, which uh, isn't that great of a setup for them uh, because along with their hypertension, they also tend to have poor oxygen delivery. These little blue things would represent arteries. They have poor oxygen delivery in the muscle, so they can't deliver oxygen to that muscle, um, and it starts to necrose or die. So at the early stages of heart failure, like the first step often is hypertension leading to concentric hypertrophy. The wall thickens but it comes at the cost that they can't supply that wall with all the blood and oxygen it needs all the time, and so it can atrophy. Here's another look at this. Uh, so here's your normal heart. If you do anything like bed rest, uh, if you get stuck inside with the coronavirus all week and you're not, or for several weeks and you're not exercise training, the heart can actually atrophy. The size of it will decrease, uh, kind of like the Grinch, I guess. Um, if you exercise train, especially endurance training, you'll see this eccentric hypertrophy where the ventricle has gotten bigger, the space inside is bigger, and the walls are slightly thicker to generate higher pressures as well. Um, if That's also a company for pregnancy because you have an increase in blood volume and you have to pump blood to uh, the baby as well. Uh, hypertension, uh, myocardial infarction, all these other things, cardiovascular disease, results in this pathologic hypertrophy or concentric hypertrophy uh, where the wall has gotten really thick and the size inside of the ventricle has shrunk. And that's a problem because now you have less blood to eject. The other problem here is uh, like with a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, uh, that means you have some kind of blockage here. So let's say you have an artery that supplies all these little muscles here in the heart. If that artery is blocked, no blood gets to it, and eventually that heart muscle is going to necrose or die. And if it progresses long enough, this hypertension, myocardial infarction, heart failure, or all these heart diseases can lead to a thinning of the wall because the, the muscle is just dying. And now it has a ridiculously thin wall and it can't pump out blood anymore. It does, it's too thin to generate a pressure to eject blood, and that's heart failure. All right, so what happens to the heart with exercise training? Heart rate, uh, let's see here, what's happening to heart rate? Uh, we have on the x-axis here, this is VO2 or exercise intensity, and then heart rate. So for a given heart, or a given VO2, so here's our untrained person, if you train, you'll require a lower heart rate because you have a bigger heart. It doesn't have to beat as much to deliver as much blood. Let's start, actually let's start looking at cardiac output. Whether trained, untrained, whatever, you have a very predictable cardiac output for a given VO2 or a given power output. So it's all about the same, the cardiac output. What differs is how they get to that cardiac output. With endurance training, you have an increase in stroke volume which means that you pump blood, more blood with each heartbeat, so you require fewer heartbeats per minute to get the same cardiac output. The other factor, um, your untrained people, they might hit a cardiac output of maybe 15, 20 liters per minute, a trained person. Uh, because that heart's so big, they can hit cardiac outputs of 35, 40 liters per minute. It's kind of like the world record. You're not gonna see anything above 40 liters per minute. Uh, 
uh, unless you're an elephant who has like a heart the size of this room and then who knows how big that cardiac output can be. Um, so in, in terms of endurance training, here's another way to look at it. This study, they took people and endurance trained these sedentary males, I believe, for 12 months, a whole year. Uh, here's what happened over time. Uh, so the increase, they saw an increase in stroke volume over time. And wall thickness increased, but it was also in proportion, that increase in wall thickness was in proportion to an increase in volume. So not only was the wall getting thicker uh, around, but the size of the ventricle was getting bigger. So it happened more or less in proportion. What doesn't change or doesn't increase is heart rate, right? And max heart rate isn't going to go up with exercise training. We just never see that. Um, I can't explain exactly why that is, but we just it, you just don't see it. Uh, so most of the adaptations to cardiac output come because of stroke volume. And the stroke volume is going to be influenced by preload, afterload, and contractility. Those three things will adapt to allow a greater stroke volume. All right, we got a black screen. Thank goodness. This was a long one. Hopefully you stopped in the middle. Uh, that's where we're going to stop for today. Have a great day.